Subject for this evening is Soviet weather engineering over North America, which they have been doing since the beginning of 1966-1967. That was the first shot, our attempt at influencing the weather directly over the United States. They then lapsed into a lot of not influencing it for a period of years, and in 1983, particularly, really opened up the big guns after having energized the infamous woodpecker signals, the so-called over-the-horizon radars, in the communication band in the mid-1970s. The first thing I'm going to have to tell you is that there are three kinds of electromagnetics and only one is being used today in the Western world. The first kind is the kind we all study as electrical engineers and even us nuclear engineers study a little bit of it. And it's classical electromagnetics. The foundations of that go back before the Civil War. It's quite old and there are serious flaws and many errors in it, as is quite well known in a few circles. The second kind, uh, first of all, let me characterize the first kind of electromagnetics. Everything is due to the force fields, the so-called electric field, magnetic field. If that reduces to zero in an area, you don't have any more electromagnetics going on in there. The potentials themselves are considered to be mathematical figments. Now I'm going to be giving you a little background. I'm going real fast through it, but you'll need this to understand what I'm talking about in the weather engineering and understand it. So please bear with me during the first part. We're going to have a little uh, quick sledding. The second kind of electromagnetics came from quantum mechanics and it's exactly opposed. The primary and real things are the potentials and the force fields, so-called, are totally derived by differentiating operations. So you see a flip-flop of 180 degrees about how the two approaches regard electromagnetics. Further, in quantum mechanics, when the electric field and the magnetic field reduce to zero in an area, you still may have the potentials. And if these potentials, which are the real things going on, interfere with each other, you can have real effects still produced in, in charged particle systems, real physical systems. As a matter of fact, in 1959, a classic paper by Aronoff and Baum in Physical Review pointed this out very strongly and since then part of that has come to be called the Baum-Aronoff effect or sometimes the Aronoff-Baum effect. It had been in physics 30 years at that point, uh, pointed out by Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner, and ignored. It has continued to be ignored in the nearly 30 years since 1959 when it was strongly pointed out by Baum and Aronoff. What we are saying, ladies and gentlemen, is if we can make this effect exist in the big world, they think it, effect, it exists only in the micro world, we can get action at a distance, that's no longer a dirty word, and we can get action even when there's no ordinary electromagnetics going on. And I'm going to show you how to do that and in the process, I'm going to show you how to change the mass and inertia of an object, affect its rate of flow through time, affect the gravitational field, and so forth. Now, the third kind of electromagnetics is the mechanism by means of which you do those things. In other words, you reduce the ordinary electromagnetics to zero, the electric field and the magnetic field, deliberately. You then, you do this by making a zero system you oppose the vectors so that they sum to zero, but they are still there in the substructure. Hey, when we studied electromagnetics, they forgot to tell us that a zero vector was not nothing. It can be a system of very active forces, each of which is time varying, and yet the system will not be detectable by any ordinary instrument. It turned out that the unorthodox scientific community in the United States have been using this for some years but not expressing it quite that succinctly. For example, the Hooper patents. What we are saying now is that if we do this, if we make deliberate zeros, 
but we make them with vectors which are still there and active, we have a new kind of electromagnetics, a third kind. And I have dubbed that scalar electromagnetics, and I hope the name, the reason for the name will become clear a little later. I won't bother to read that thing. We simply have a zero vector envelope, but it's the substructure that we have placed within a zero that is fantastic. In terms of modern physics, we have reached into the virtual world what happens before physical change occurs, and we now can deliberately engineer it. Let me say that again in case it went by you. With this simple mechanism, with few coils and transistors and so forth, by making deliberate zeros, we can deliberately engineer the Schrodinger equation, and we can deliberately affect the probabilities of quantum mechanics. The hidden variable theory now becomes directly engineerable in all the implications of what I have said. What had been statistical before now becomes at least partly deterministic. I'm going to jump now a whole bunch of years. In 1921, at the instigation or recommendation of Albert Einstein, a man by the name of Colusa succeeded, uh, published a paper where he had successfully united electrical field and gravitational field in a common unified theory. To do that, he had to add another physical dimension. And a very strange thing emerged. There's really only one field in nature if you're looking at that hyperspace. It is the five-dimensional gravitational field. And it intersects our world in two things. One thing we call the electromagnetic field, and the other thing we call the gravitational field in the general sense, general relativity, the ability to curve and warp and twist space-time itself. And by the way, the electromagnetics just turned out to be the fifth dimensional aspect of that. So we added one more space dimension, which we do not see. Klein, a few years later, explained what happened to that dimension. It's really rolled up around every little point in our space. Quite nice mathematically, and it's real, by the way. But the, the theory languished for many years until really about the early to mid-70s, when the new symmetries in the forefront of physics and particle physics began to see that with that type of geometry, you could get in all these weird particles and you could get in all the forces. You really could begin to approach a unified theory of all forces of nature. And the physicists became very excited. The modern theory, a variant of that theory, Calusa-Klein geometry, has 11 dimensions, 10 space, one time. All but the three ordinary space dimensions we see are considered to be rolled up in little circles around every point. But with that thing and supergravity, you can get in all of the particles and everything we know into physics in a single unified theory. And the physicists are excited. That's the hottest thing in physics. They just haven't discovered yet that it is directly engineerable in the simplest fashion you ever dreamed of. I'm going to give you a very simple thing now to let you understand what I'm talking about. This is schematic, so don't think of the thing as being spatially separated between the two little circles on the, on the plane. The plane represents our ordinary world. The hand represents an extra dimension, so it's that fifth dimensional uh, geometry that uh, Calusa came up with in 1921. The hand itself represents that fifth dimensional gravitational field which intersects our world in two fashions. One electromagnetic shown by the forefinger extended, that intersection, and the other by the thumb, which is our gravitational field, as we see it in the little intersections. And both of the intersections, by the way, at the same point. They are not spatially separated. Normally, we don't make vector zeros. Nobody ever trained us to do that in electromagnetics. There is not a single textbook, either physics or electromagnetics in the United States of America or in the Western world that dwells upon what you do when you deliberately make such vector zeros. I, I'm almost willing to state 
that probably not a single orthodox physicist has made such an experiment. If they are, it will be only one or two of them. But notice what we do if we deliberately zero the electromagnetic intersection, which is what we're doing when we make the zero. But we control what goes into the zero. We can put energy in there, or we can take the energy out. When we do that, it's coming in and out of the thumb as gravitational energy, directly as curvature of space-time. Now, what have we said? We have said that rigorously, with that simple mechanism, I can provide the direct conversion of electromagnetic energy into gravitational field energy, or vice versa. Now, if you want to do any gravity, gentlemen, there it is. And the unorthodox researchers have been doing anti-gravity a little bit in this country for a period of years, like levitating 65 pounds, like plywood, which is not magnetic field. So with a very simple thing and looking at it through modern eyes and adding that single thing, we can now use electromagnetics to make gravitational field energy in the general sense or vice versa. We can warp, engineer, and twist space-time at will, as we wish, in whatever pattern we wish. And it's been in the literature, if you cared to notice, since 1921. I won't dwell on this. I will simply state that all that a mass is anyway, a, a particle of mass, is in fact a trapped scalar resonance. I'm going to give you a quick once-over about scalar resonance and we'll go on. Take a normal resonance system with a wave moving back and forth in a cavity so that it's in phase and coherent. Suppose that there were two waves moving along together, but the second wave, the electric and magnetic field were 180 out from the first one. That's a scalar resonance system. Your normal instrument won't even see it. We can build special detectors and have that will see it. That's all a mass is, but you can make a current of that kind of resonance, and you can pipe that current down a wire, or you can add to that resonance in the system, or you can take it away. What did I say? I said you can pump the mass and inertia directly into an object and increase it, or you can pump it out of there. And if you pump all of it out of there, it'll dematerialize on you. And the th statements I am making are based in part on experimental evidence in the laboratory, private, proprietary laboratories. Now, the scalar wave, that is the wave that has a zero resultant for the electric field and a zero resultant for the magnetic field, but it's composed of components which are waving and, and moving and communicating and everything else, is the universal wave in the universe, totally undiscovered as yet in Western science. But you can make it for 10 cents on the laboratory bench. You can convert a radar very simply to be a scalar radar, for example. These waves come from and go to the nucleus. They go right through the Faraday cage. They do not interact with the electrons unless you have the most extreme nonlinear situation you've ever heard of. They don't move electrons. And you can go right through any Faraday cage. You can go right through the Earth, for example, and you can go through the ocean with megahertz signals using these techniques. As we sit here talking, the Soviet Union is communicating worldwide uh, as of 10 days ago, they were communicating on well over 37 frequencies in their command and control systems for the large weapon systems they built for strategic weapons in this fashion. I have a personal friend that can deliver on the shelf the communication system, prototype already built and tested, that will prove that statement. And I challenge anybody in the United States outside of him at the present time to measure that communication system. These are nuclear waves. They communicate between nuclei. And if you put in that substructure the correct pattern, you can go in and transmute elements. In modern physics, to make a proton, a neutron, or vice versa, all you got to do is flip one quark. And that is simply a pattern in the substructure. A man was nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1977 for proving that biological systems 
transmute elements even though they only have millivolts and microvolts to use. And I bet you didn't even know that. His name was Curvon. Today he's dead. All the nuclei of the universe are in constant communication. Much of vacuum space-time is made up of these scalar waves between the nuclei throughout the universe. Another thing that came out of the general relativistic wave, these are general relativistic waves. Special relativity does not apply. We are always in a curved space-time when we're using them. Uh, part of the thing that came out of the theory is you are no longer confined to the speed of light at all. If you're clever, you can get almost any velocity you want to, whether it's slower in the speed of light or faster. Uh, Tesla, for example, who was using these kinds of waves shortly after 1900 and keeping it a deep, dark secret, Tesla reported speeds of 50 times the speed of light. I have personally participated in an experiment which kicked out an electromagnetic wave of this type at eight times the speed of light. If you'll check the Russian literature, and I'll give you the references if you're interested, the speed of light is variable anyway. <clears throat> it's been known for 80 years by the astronomers that the speed of light in a hard vacuum on the surface of the Earth is a little faster than the speed of light in the deep space away from the charged particles. So these are nuclear waves. They are not electromagnetic waves that interact with the electron shells. They, electron, they interact with the nuclei and with the internal components of the proton and the neutron. What I have the audacity to say to you is that we now have a tool that we do not have to talk about nuclear physics. We can go in there and engineer the nucleus. And transmutation is only one of the things that can be done. And again, the basis for this has been well established in the literature since 1921. With these waves, you see most of our ideas of the macro world are given to us by the ordinary photon interaction, which is almost always an interaction with the electron shells. This is a different order of reality. We're really dealing now in hyperspaces, at least 11 dimensions, and the world looks quite different indeed. And physical reality in this kind of physics looks quite different indeed from the ideas we have in our head from classical electromagnetics and classical physics and the normal macro world. Just as quantum mechanics was a drastic change to classical mechanics, this is an even further drastic change to quantum mechanics because it makes what had been statistical now deterministic and engineerable. I'm an engineer. I don't want to play statistics. I want to make models and I want to make the sucker work. The great cosmic engines of the universe do not operate with the residues of the differential operators making the force fields. That's the garbage that's thrown out. The great cosmic engines of the universe operate inside vector zero systems. That includes all the nuclei in the universe and everything inside them that modern physics has found out about. Okay, this kind of wave can be modeled as a longitudinal wave. I won't go into that whole treatment. I'll just say that uh, whereas you model the normal wave as a transverse wave, you model this one as a longitudinal wave. And indeed, when you interfere this wave, you break up the coherence of the substructure. They now no longer sum to zero, and guess what that gives you? It gives you a non-zero vector in the E field and the B field out there. Real energy now appears at a distance out there from a two transmitters or two wave projectors, and yet what's in the middle is not energy flow in the normal sense that we transmit an ordinary electromagnetic wave. It's really an artificial potential. The closest thing we have to calling it is an electrostatic wave. A more accurate description is it is a direct wave in the curvature of space-time itself. It's a general relativistic wave or a gravitational wave. So if we have two projectors, and they might be two modified radar antenna, and we intersect them at a distance, we can produce energy at a distance. And that energy arises in the space-time of that intersection zone. It doesn't matter if that's inside a mountain or inside a missile or inside an airplane or inside a human body. I have given you now the secret of how to build Tesla's vaunted death ray to mow down people by the thousands, which you can do with that device right there. And you can modify ordinary radars to do that. 
it has another very nice feature. In modern physics, space-time has a very high charge, very high potential. They call it a pseudo-potential. If I lower the potential of my projectors below zero, in other words, I make negative potentials, and pretty strong negative, what happens in the intersection zone is not the appearance of energy, but the disappearance of energy. When I bend space-time, if I bend it in one fashion, the local region looks like a source. It looks like it's producing energy. If I bend it the other way, it looks like a sink. It looks like energy is disappearing. This is real. This is general relativity. Now, conservation of energy law that we apply in special relativity has gone out the window, as is well known in physics. In a local general relativistic system, you do not have to conserve energy at all. What really happens is I either put the energy in here and get it out there, or I take it out from there and I get it back here and I better dump it or I'll burn out my projectors. Well, it's you make a dump and you simply transform it in the other mode and switch it over to the dump. That's the way the Soviets do it. Nature has been doing this all the time and fault zones and stresses in the rocks and all the interference of the scalar potentials that are made there create fields at a distance, glowing lights. This is a picture of earthquake lights from the U.S. Geological Service. There are 1,200 locations in the United States alone where you can see glowing balls of energy, electromagnetic energy, controlled energy at a distance on any decent weather night. If you care to go out there and look and take pictures, it's easy to investigate. The so-called Earth stress lights. And with this modality, by using one additional thing, by using three-dimensional interferometry and using Fourier expansions, multiple frequencies, you can make such control balls of electromagnetic energy at a distance just like that, like the snap of a finger. We have done that in the laboratory. The human system and everything that's a mammal, the rats and the roaches, everything else even, uh, have been doing this all the time. We measure brain waves, we measure the residue, E field and B field, that's going on. What's really going in the brain is all the little ion fields that, that make electric fields and make magnetic fields that sum to zero. The structure of that is the real activity of the human brain. I think without dwelling on it that you can see the two cerebral hemispheres make a scalar interferometer, and if those patterns are correct, you can project or create energy at a distance like inside a metal object, and you can get metal bending that way. Now, the kind of metal bending I'm talking about is not the amazing Randy bending something on his belt buckle when you're not looking at him. I'm talking about what Jack Houck does when he takes a control sample and another sample, and a little old lady in tennis shoes who just happens to be a four-star general's wife bends that thing which is thick as your little finger and the highest test steel known to aerospace industry, bends that thing in an angle and it turns blue. He takes both samples, the control sample and that sample, back to the laboratory sections and looks at them under the electron microscope. And the one that is the control sample has the normal grain structure. The one that is the one that's bent by the human being for real, not fakery, has no grain structure. The grain structure has been destroyed. It looks like the surface of the moon has been subjected to intense point heating throughout the grain structure. I have just given you the physical mechanism and the physics by which the body is able to do that. It is real. It is not a fake. Jack Halk, I believe, does he not work for your company? Excellent fellow, excellent scientist. I won't dwell on what all else the biological system can do with that. Let us suffice to say that we can derive rigorously in terms of physics, not metaphysics, all of the mechanisms for parapsychology. Well, if you were weaponizing that for a big weapon, if you hit this thing explosively with your projectors and you fire two pulses so the pulses meet, an interesting thing occurs. If you fire it in the high potential mode, you get an electromagnetic explosion at a distance. If you fire in the low potential mode, you get a cold explosion at a distance, the sudden withdrawal of energy in the intersection zone. Both types of weapons widely deployed by the Soviet Union and tested. Uh, the recent, uh, some years back, so-called booms off the East Coast, some of those were seen as flashes, estimated to be about 100 uh, tons 
of TNT equivalent were actually the orientation and alignment of such howitzers in the Soviet Union. They have had such howitzers since April 1963. Specifically, the first operational test was April the 11th, 1963, 100 miles north of Puerto Rico. The most dramatic uh, expression of the cold explosion in recent times occurred on April the 9th, 1984, and the papers fortunately won't let this one go. Off the coast of Japan, about 150 or 200 miles, well, really 200 miles from downtown Tokyo, out near the Kuros, a sudden gigantic explosive eruption occurred above the water. A cloud, so to speak, very dense, rose rapidly to 60,000 feet and 150 mile diameter. Five 747s out there, one of which was piloted by a former B-52 pilot who thought he'd just seen the most massive nuclear explosion you ever saw. It had the mushroom shape. Uh, prepared evasive action, turned off course, put on oxygen mask, prepared and braced for a shock wave which never came. There was no flash. This was the cold explosion. The laser physicist friend of mine that I'm working with in California, in the laboratory where we're using only milliwatts, at best, and we're using distances about that far, has done a little cold explosion over a dish of water, and you get the mushroom cloud exactly like that, rising. That thing was called everything under the sun, bubbling gas, you know, uh, plumes, all sorts of things. It was a cold explosion. The ocean there is 21,000 feet deep. It's too deep for submarines. Indicates it was a man-made phenomenon, but it didn't end there. Dr. Daniel Walker and colleagues who have access to sophisticated underwater acoustic equipment and seismic equipment did a complete study on that thing. It's published in the journal Science recently. As a matter of fact, after his study, he successfully ruled out any kind of ordinary, known, natural phenomenon. So we're left with the conclusion that he and his colleagues made it's either a man-made phenomenon or an as yet unknown natural phenomenon. We shouldn't have too many natural phenomena unknown that explode for 150 miles, particularly when it's happened several times before in the open literature. That is a rigorous paper published in the journal Science very recently. Unfortunately, the journal saw fit to turn down my colleague and my explanation of what was going on and a complete date list of incidents and history and types of Soviet weapons to back it up. Here's just one more incident to show you that these types of sudden mushroom rises from the ocean or near the ocean above the ocean in gigantic size have occurred repeatedly with other suspicious incidents. That particular earthquake is highly suspect. Can you not see that if I dump energy with very powerful radiators and continue to dump energy on both sides of a fault zone, it doesn't matter where the extra energy comes from. With the piezoelectric effect, I'm transforming that into mechanical stress. And if I do that long enough and build up enough energy, that plate is going to slip and you'll get a natural earthquake, natural looking earthquake, man-made. That's how you make earthquakes. Well, if you do it in the cold explosion, you're going to have to dump a lot of that energy when it's 150 miles across. That is one whale of a lot of energy that you suddenly extracted and here it comes. It's headed for you. It'll simply melt your projectors unless you dump it somewhere. So you switch the projector into the transmit mode and you catch it and hold it in a storage bank temporarily and then you fire it off somewhere where it won't do any harm, like Bennett Island. Here is an exhaust that is 150 miles long, seen by our weather satellites from a site that repeatedly exhibits these, almost 100 now that we've seen. This particular exhaust is about one, a little over one degree above the horizontal. Now volcanoes don't do that, they don't look like that. Let's see the next slide. From the same island, we see double puffs indicating the interferometer transmitters. We see mul multiple puffs within them sometimes. And in fact, the satellites have even from time to time caught the actual burst showing that it's an explosive beginning of the exhaust. 
These are weather satellites, U.S. weather satellites. They are not classified. Unfortunately, they're from way out there. We need some low-level satellite photography, which I simply do not have. It would be interesting to look at it if I had it. Here's one where the explosive burst was caught just erupting from the island. These things here blaze away sometimes for hours and hours and days at a time with those kinds of massive exhausts of heat and energy. I'll show you where they're pulling out the energy and what they're doing with it. Uh, that's about the plumes, just to show you that way back there from those exhaust plumes off that island, we had some airplanes flew through it. They're mostly ice particles from the expansion and so forth, as you would expect when you've dumped a phenomenon. Actually, you entrain a lot of the cold air. You get circulations. You get all kinds of effects there. So you do get a lot of ice formed, a little mud, and this kind of thing. There is a second candidate right now, courtesy of some effort by Tom Harrell and some kind folks um, up at the, sat the satellite imagery outfit. Uh, this one shows, and I can't be begin to pronounce that name. Can you say that for me off the slide? Novaya Zemla. Novaya Zemla, which is an island north of the Soviet Union up in the Arctic Circle there. Not too far, really as a geographical distance goes from Bennett Island. And here again on the extreme left, you see another exhaust, and you see the gigantic weather circulation that so much additional energy being poured in the area causes. You see the swirl all the way around the thing, stripping uh, vapor energy and vapor water and so forth from the snow and ice and everything else. Okay. Well, in the mid-70s, we got a shock. Suddenly, the communication systems throughout the world in the communications band, that is from 5 to 30 megahertz, were widely being interrupted by extremely powerful signals coming from the Soviet Union. To my knowledge, we have not yet located the transmitters. They had many resemblances to what we call an over-the-horizon radar, so we promptly labeled, labeled them an over-the-horizon radar. The so-called woodpecker signal is named from the chirp signal that sounds like a woodpecker's beak hitting a flat block. You can hear them out there most every night chattering away, still interfering. In fact, they now sell the ham radio operator's filters so that it operates through that, filters out in that region. But what they actually did shortly before the death of Brezhnev, they started adjusting across the United States a great interference pattern from multiple transmitters of the woodpecker radars. Now, I'm not interested, except for biological effects, which can be damaging, in the conventional E field, B field signals on that radar. But we don't have anybody who's measuring the scalar component, the substructure in the zero. They don't even have the instruments to do it. If they wish such instruments provided, I have a friend who'll do it for price. Not me, he will. He built the instruments and, and designed them. But what they're doing here is the substructure interference, which is important, because that's where all the real energy is. You can put as much energy as you wish into that substructure, and the normal instrument will not even see it. It won't even detect it. Anyway, where the interference was, if you'll check the woodpecker signals, you'll see that's the type of interference pattern. They set up an interference pattern over the US, and it left signals, signatures. When you adjust these things and you adjust with little slips, you pop out energy, you get rumbles and booms and airquakes and all this, and those things happened from Florida, North Alabama, Virginia, all up through the Carolinas, up through Mid-England, up through the middle of the country, Texas, all over, West Coast, everywhere. These mysterious cracks and rumbles and booms and pops and snaps everywhere while they were adjusting the grid. Well, they got it adjusted by shortly after the end of the year, that is in early 1983, they got this thing adjusted and they started pouring it on us. So that spring, early spring, you had extremely severe flooding because what they did, you simply determined by your timing and interferometry and Fourier transforms, which one of the grid cells you want to activate. And they're much finer than this. By the way, over Huntsville, Alabama, a friend and I saw this grid from horizon to horizon in even plowed field rows north to south, and from horizon to horizon in even 
plowed rows from east to west, and that is not natural. It does not happen. Anyway, what they did is you, if you take energy out of one cell, that produces a low zone, a low pressure zone. If you add energy in another cell, that produces a high pressure zone. I think you can see, if I scan my radar, or rotate it, the beam, either electromagnetically or rotate the antenna, gently and move those highs and lows alone, I can direct and capture and control the jet streams. And that's exactly what they did. The jet streams had a classic bend dipping way down south abnormally far and then roaring up the Adirondack chain. And so we had all kinds of good weather following that pattern and the deviation of the jet streams. Even the journal Science has published an article from a study that shows in the last decade the variation in the weather over North America has been greater than can be statistically expected except once in 1,200 years. That summer we got a drought, if you recall. We lost half the corn crop in the United States in one summer from the extreme drought. When you form one of the patterns, you get a signature in the clouds. You see a, a little droplet of water is formed around a dust particle, a little droplet of ice if it's cold enough. And it makes a little transistor or a little diode in the middle, and that thing forms its own little E field. And these things line up. And what you get is you get a ring, almost a complete ring, about two thirds of a ring of clouds, like geometrically drawn around the peak where the energy is, is being manipulated. And you get radial lines, thin radial lines running directly away for 10 or 15 miles. Sort of like the old rising sun symbol in World War II. We saw these all over the United States. Here's one taking a block and a half from my home. By the time I could run in and get my camera, it had passed just over the mountain. But you can see those are cloud streamers. Those are not light rays. These are not crepuscular waves at all. These are cloud rays. These are radials, giant radials. I then went ahead and chased that thing over the mountain to get a little better shot of it. They had cut the energy so the middle ring filled up, but the rays were still apparent in the next slide although I'm now shooting at an extreme distance uh, through a telescopic lens. But you can see if the lights were a little dimmer, you could see the crosshatch interference pattern in the streamers also. So we have both the streamers and we have the crosshatch interference pattern existing in the clouds. That's over Huntsville, Alabama. Here's one that a correspondent sent in, and again we have dim light. The clouds are actually more prominent than that from California. They were seeing them all over the United States, these very prominent, very significant patterns everywhere. I went on radio, uh, KABC in Los Angeles, calling everybody's attention to this two or three times, delivered papers at a couple of symposia, and we saw a change. We saw the doggone thing start getting active most of the time at night. There's another pattern. Sometimes they use two patterns close together. When that happens, the internal rings go out and the rays become much thicker and they become absolutely boat-tailed toward the center. Now, when they cut the power, the center fills up immediately with clouds. I have been unfortunate, and although I have seen classic ones of this, I have not yet got a decent picture. I will show you what I have, which is not a good photograph, and the photographs then, therefore, should not be accepted as proof until I get better photographs which I will do sooner or later. Again, multiple witnesses over Huntsville, Alabama, a good friend of mine, and I saw this very early in the morning, this system motoring along, absolutely classic. I was very hard pressed that day on my normal job and did not take off from work and go home and get my camera. I have regretted it ever since, deeply. I didn't realize how rare the phenomenon was going to be, to be able to get one that perfect. But it was absolutely flawless and it looked just like that right over Huntsville, Alabama, moving along at, oh, 20 to 30 miles an hour. A second one came over later that day. There's the dates and the time. Uh, in their weather control, if you recall, they gave us anomalous winter, the very cold December snap of 1983, which broke all the records everywhere. Many of them since records had been kept on the cold and that was deliberately engineered. They left signatures before they did it with these kinds of things all over the U.S. We saw the same day uh, remnants of a second twin giant radial system that motored along across Huntsville, Alabama. 
Now, here is one, they've cut the power, but the system persists for a while. It'll persist for several hours, but it'll fill in. It will lose its classic shape. But, you know, even a filled-in picture is better than no picture, but I don't have a lens which will take the entire sky. I need a fisheye, which I'm going to get as soon as I can afford it. But what I want to show you is this is on the, I believe, the northeast here, and I want to focus your attention here over to the right. You will see the lines of the clouds going there. They go all over the sky back to the other radial on the other side. Completely over your head is this giant radial connected up to two points, even though it's filling in now because the power has been cut. In this photograph, we're just a little bit back around from where we were to the left to show that the same cloud streaks and radials are going over on the left, and they go completely across for about 15 miles to the next point, the next radial intersection where they link up. Now we'll show that other linkage down on the other end as a separate shot. And this really, as you can see, it does go on down there and link up. It's just beyond the tree line where it links. It's faded on that end pretty good. But we had a whole two radial system, a poor picture here, I admit. But having seen much better ones than this, when I did not have a camera or access to one, I can only tell you that in the future I will show you a decent photograph if they keep this thing up over Huntsville, Alabama long enough. And if Tom Harold and other assorted good stalwart fellows help me keep watch for them when I'm working inside and not out looking at the sky. Well, you wonder what happened to you on February the 1st. Let me tell you what happened to you on February the 1st. On December the 8th, they started this little goody. Out in California, they were having these little rumbles and cracks and pops and snaps off the coast there from, Cali from uh, Los Angeles. They had it for about a week off and on. I was there on a radio show delivering an address on free energy. Went on another show to try to explain what these things was, and I predicted based on this that they had finished adjusting the grid and there would be a violent or drastic change in the weather within 48 hours. I went on the radio and I made that statement and the radio announcer said, you sound like a wacko and cut me off. That's some of the mild things I've been caused. It does not matter. I operate on the thing that if the experiments keep working and they contradict the theory, the true scientific method says you must change the theory, not insist that the experiment is false if it continues to be replicated. So what happened was they then, when they got it adjusted, a high wind came up very suddenly, totally unexpected, blew down all the trees on the boulevards. They had wrecks and everything. I was there during this process, and it was within 48 hours from that prediction. Violent sort of wind storms. Uh, winds got very high in the Los Angeles area, and all the orange trees were laying over flat everywhere through the boulevards. It went on down in Texas, spawned tornadoes, and roared up the Adirondack chain, and then they bent the jet stream in a most anomalous fashion. They bent that sucker right down the west coast of the United States, all the way down to the bottom and turned it and went across the bottom, skimming across just above the bottom of Texas and then roaring up the Adirondack chain. I've never seen that fashion before, but they set about doing that in December 1984. They kept playing with the jet stream. They did all kinds of nice experiments. They split the thing into two. They made it form into Ys and looked like they were just checking out to see what all they could do. But with this fashion here, what you do is when you turn, you entrain circulation from way out over the Pacific, as shown by the purple arrows. You pull moisture all the way from out in the Pacific and suck it up right across the United States. And if you do the, the neat little trick, with the cold stuff, you get enough cold stuff bent down from Canada and the Arctic here, guess what you're going to get with all that moisture? You're going to get snow and ice, and February the 1st, they let us have it. And that's our infamous ice storm right here in Huntsville, Alabama. All this was going on just before that. Having gone several days without power myself, uh, I'm very sympathetic to the fact that I don't like that, and I hope you didn't either. But that was given to you courtesy of the Hammer and Sickle Boys. Okay, there are a couple other little things I'll throw in just for little goodies. You may or may not have seen the paper on the Associated Press release, but I'll give you the mechanism. 
and everybody else will tell you I'm totally crazy, and I'll say to you, then you explain it, or ask them to, and listen to their jaw fly open and find out they have no explanation at all, because this explanation isn't in the textbook. The Navy was having a chaff drop off the coast from San Diego. A very strange and sudden and unexpected wind again arose. You know, when we form these lows, wind rushes in. And so we got another one, and here came a signature, a sudden, strange, unexpected wind. Caught the entire chaff cloud, they were about 150 miles off the coast there, and blew the thing in towards San Diego. Now, this is the standard microwire chaff, actually with a dielectric with a coating on it. There's a certain way it's structured for some kinds of chaff that we have shown in the laboratory will reflect a scalar wave. I won't go into that, that's proprietary to my friend. Imagine every little piece of chaff up there, if the bandwidth, if a scalar signal in that frequency, in its bandwidth that it's cut for is there, it will reflect it. That's what we're saying. And from any two of those things randomly wiggling and jiggling around, you're going to have random intersections and interferences from the reflected scalar beams. And in that little random interference zone, you're going to get a sudden flash, a sudden sparkle, it won't be visual, but a sudden production of ordinary electromagnetic energy. And so imagine a zone around the chaff cloud with little twinkles if you could see ordinary electromagnetic energy, if you, if you could see them as visual things, twinkling and twinkling away, and these represent little instantaneous kindling of energy points. When they move through the system area, they appear in the space-time. Faraday cages and your EMI shielding we all use in military equipment have absolutely zero effect on them. They knocked out over 60, 000, power to over 60,000 homes in San Diego. And you had the strange thing of the part of the city uh, very angry at the Navy and claiming the Navy had done this. And the Navy set out an investigation and got the foggiest notion what happened. I just told you what happened and gave you the mechanism. That isn't all that happens. I hope you realize that I am stating that in my opinion the Soviet Union has been waging a certain kind of undeclared war on the United States for a period of over two decades, and that several hundred people have already died in that war, American citizens, illegally. All of you recall the mysterious airliner, the airliner that fell mysteriously rather for six miles in about a uh, couple of minutes. What happened? Well, he's motoring along up there coming in towards Los Angeles. He's out of San Francisco there. He hits a sudden little pocket of turbulence. Ring any bells? Some interference going on where the energy wasn't zero anymore and you're getting energy in one fashion or the other or ripples. Turbulence. All of a sudden, one engine flames out just past that. Well, one of the things that'll kindle this stuff into being is a plasma or a flame the fierce flame in a jet engine, you know, the plasma that it forms, so to speak, the ions. You can get the same effect in the ions. A Geiger tube, for example, will detect, a Geiger counter will detect these. It doesn't detect nuclear radiation, it detects its own ionization. This will give you additional ionization or kill ionization and the tube will detect that. So one engine flamed out and then all the, other fell, uh, all the others failed and this thing fell. The pilot struggled with the airplane began to regain control as he got much lower, down around 15,000 feet. Meanwhile, the landing gear had come down, the door had fallen off, damaged the tail. He finally got control of the thing down around 11,000 feet, some control. The engines began to restart, and at about 9,000 feet, he got her under control again and managed to fly that thing into San Francisco, the nearest airport and land. It left a signature. Now, they're going to say the pilot did that. I'm going to tell you what happened, in my opinion, you understand. What actually happened was, as I described it, from the scalar stuff that was up there, it happened to be at the right frequency. And when he, it was a high interference zone, well up there. He was flying at 41,000 feet. He was way up there. When he passed out of the interference zone, the stuff started dying back out. It charges mass just like a capacitor. It has a discharge time constant. We've proven that. When it discharged the effect, the plane was then a normal type of flame exhaust. And so the thing could start again. Now, it left a signature. The instruments on the airplane disagreed with one another because the electromagnetic response of an instrument or the components of an instrument to scalar is not in the specifications for that component. 
In the future, we will be able eventually to buy components where that the second order effects, the scalar effects are controlled and we'll buy them to those specs also. Right now you can't do that. So some of the instruments will respond one way and some will respond the other way. The flight instruments told the pilot and crew one thing and the flight recorder told an entirely different story. The flight crew instruments reported that the autopilot was gone, out of, you know, had, had quit. And it was up to the pilot to fly the airplane. So the pilot was taking proper emergency procedures for that kind of an emergency. Engine flame out, autopilot gone. He was trying to do the job. The flight recorder recorded that the engines never died out, or at least most of them didn't, and that the autopilot never died out. Now I submit to you that when your engines flame out in a jet, it's about like running into almost a brick wall, suddenly a very soft, spongy wall, or like having a big blowout on your car. There's not much way a seasoned pilot can fail to notice engine flame out, particularly all four engines. So we can take the pilot's word for that. It's the instruments which lied because they had a uh, response to the scalar stuff that disagreed with each other. One responded one way, one the other. That will never appear in the official investigation. Now, that is not the only airplane having such difficulties. One of the European nations, which I shall not name, has repeated difficulties with their airplanes flying off the west coast. And that is not in the newspaper, and that has not been announced, but it is a fact, and I'm prepared to back it up if I have to. At any rate, we have had multiple cases, not quite so dramatic, and continuing cases of the same phenom phenomenon on a less drastic scale, and it continues to this day. Okay, now what I've gone through here for the last period is a presentation to you on a scheme by means of which you can control the weather around the world. Perhaps you can't control it absolutely, but you can certainly drastically influence it. You can do a lot of other things I hope you see. I hope you notice that we can knock out missiles, airplane, anything electronics, including the electromagnetic responses of the human being. In Afghanistan, when the high-end helicopters come in and fire gas, now gas kills people, but even with nerve gas, they kick a while. It takes a few seconds at least to die, and the body goes into violent responses. Very violent if you've ever seen an animal die from nerve gas. Many of the people that are killed die with nerve gas. Some are given mustard, hit with mustard and so forth. They die with those symptoms. But there is another symptom which also is exhibited. Now I have this on correspondence from people who've been there on the scene. Some of the people simply cut off wherever they are. Their nervous system never fires another input anywhere in their body. No reflex action, no nothing. No kicking, no fighting, no fuss, no fury. Instantaneous death, and that is a scalar signature. Fortunately, I used to say one nation, I will now say two nations, which are non-hostile to the United States, also have these weapons. I shall not name those nations publicly and have had them for an extended period of time, at least since shortly after 1969. Right now, the only thing that stops the Soviet Union from feeling free to move with this kind of weaponry, which I think you can begin to see the implications against tanks, anything else electronically controlled on the battlefield, is the other two nations, not the United States. So for a period of time, one of my purposes has been to warn the system a new kind of electromagnetics, a more extended electromagnetics already exists in the textbooks and been there since 1921. With this kind of electromagnetics, we can achieve types of engineering we have only dreamed of in the past. And this time, it's not us that got the atomic bomb first. It's the other guy. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>